Amen. Praise God. All right, we're going to be reading the story of Jesus' birth out of Luke chapter 2. And it's it's kind of a long, uh, long story. Y'all know that, right? Have, do y'all read it at your house every Christmas? Yes. Or either that or Matthew, right? should read it. I mean, you want to remember to read the Christmas story. I know that we've been reading it at our house for a long time. We usually let the kids do it. I kind of look around sometimes and watch everybody seems sometimes to be so bored with us. Oh, here we go. But you know, this is the this is the story of the birth of the Savior. Amen. Amen. And uh, and so I, I and I look. Paul told young Timothy, a pastor, he said, "You need to pay." attention to the public reading of scripture so whether or not it's cool in the modern church or not to read long portions of scripture i'm not really even concerned about that i just know what we were told to do amen well the title of my message this morning is this is my word this is my will will you hear will you obey luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 38 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from caesar augustus that all the world should be taxed and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son. I don't know, you know, people that have been coming on Wednesday nights would be familiar with the fact that we've been studying the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers and talking about the firstborn and, and all of the things that are connected to that and how God, during the Passover, if you'll remember, um, I'm just kind of talking right now, but it, it has it's important to understand sometimes people, whenever they read the Old Testament or they study the Old Testament, like, why do I really even need to know that? Well, whenever you start to study, you begin to understand better that there's actually application here. It's relevant here in the sense that whenever God killed the firstborn with the plague in Exodus, he said, now, now you're firstborn. Every time you have a firstborn male that's born, you need to be reminded of the fact that I delivered you. Amen. And the way that God delivered his people, Israel, was through a Passover lamb. He killed that lamb. And he told Moses to kill that lamb to collect his blood and to paint it on the doorpost of their home. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, meaning judgment. I will recognize that judgment was placed on that lamb and therefore it will not be placed on you. And I got to tell you that the New Testament revelation of that is that the fact that Jesus is our Passover oh, yes. lamb. Amen. Amen. He was our sacrifice. And so and Jesus was also the firstborn. Amen. And he was the sacrifice that we that, that was given unto us. He was the firstborn of God and he was the firstborn of Mary. And it says and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. 
And when eight days were accomplished from the circumcising of the child, we learned that too in the book of Exodus. That was the law. His name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel because he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, we learned that in the book of Leviticus, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. You know, I'm just going to hold off a second there because I like talking about things whenever I get to a, a spot in the Bible that I think it bears a little bit of, of discussion. You know, whenever we talk about in the Old Testament and that the firstborn was born, I just explained to you the Exodus story and that God said whenever the firstborn male is born, you're going to offer up a sacrifice in order to redeem him. He constantly, God constantly wanted his people Israel to be reminded of the fact that he delivered them out of, out of uh, Egyptian bondage. And one of the things that we learned when we studied the book of Exodus was that, uh, and this doesn't have a whole lot to, it has a lot to do with the Christmas story, but it, it wasn't in my notes. But I just wanted to say that uh, time and again, one of the things that he told them in the book of Exodus was that every time a firstborn was born, that they had to offer up a sacrifice for the, for the, for the males, right? Uh, whether it be a, a bullock, but in the case of poor people, turtle doves. Okay, so that everybody was able to do what it was that the Lord wanted them to do. But then also, whenever the animals were born, the firstborn male that opened the womb, okay, was, was, there was a sacrifice that had to be offered. If it, was a, if it was a lamb, the firstborn lamb or bullock or whatever the case had to be sacrificed because it, it was a representation. It was a type. In the Old Testament, thousands of years before Jesus would be born, a type of the fact that God had a plan, that he was sending his firstborn into the world that was going to die, and through his death was going to redeem sinful man. And now Israel didn't necessarily know that. What they knew was that God had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage, just like you and I, born of Adam, were born in bondage and slavery to the sin of this world. His people, Israel, had been enslaved to Egypt and God delivered them out. But listen, when, so if a, if a lamb was born and it was the firstborn male, you had to kill it. But even the donkey, the unclean, had to be redeemed. And this was the thing, is if you wanted to keep the donkey, then you had to offer up a lamb in its place. But if you didn't want to keep the donkey, then you could kill the donkey. Listen, and something had to die as a remembrance that God had delivered his people. And he kept telling them, you're going to do this every year. And to the point where one day your children are going to get old enough to ask. They're going to get old enough to ask and they're going to be like, that. why, daddy? Why do we keep on killing our own livestock? Why is it every time that a firstborn male lamb, I liked that lamb. That was the cutest little lamb that was ever. Why do we have to keep on killing these lambs? Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because we have to be reminded of the day. Whenever our God with a mighty hand delivered us out from this Hallelujah. Egyptian bondage and delivered us. Listen to me. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Right. We're supposed to train our children up in the ways of the Lord. Right. We're supposed to tell them until we can't tell them anymore. God said in the book of Deuteronomy that you're supposed to write it on your forehead, wear it as a bracelet on your wrist, put it on a placard on your house. You tell them when you wake up in the morning and you tell them when you go to sleep. You tell them at the dinner table and you tell them throughout the day. They might get tired of hearing it. They might start squinching up their nose and looking like the Grinch when you keep on talking about Jesus. Jesus, but that's neither here nor there. It's not for you to worry about how they respond. If you're going to be a parent that's going to raise godly seed, you are to do what the Lord has told you to do, whether they receive it today or not. The Word of God says that if you train up a child in the way they should go, when they grow old, they won't depart from it. They might have to go through some things. They might have to experience some pain and some circumstance. But if you will do what God has asked you to do, they will at least have been introduced to the truth of the gospel, they will at least have been told the story that God had a plan and that he sent his son, amen, to die. And that's what he did for Israel. He wanted them to know and he wanted them to be reminded time and time again that he had a plan, amen, and he amen. wants us to do the same. And so that's what we ventured off there. They were bringing two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and the same man was Justin Devout. 
And he was waiting for the consolation, which in the Greek is just another way to say the comfort of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. You know, we talk about this. A lot of people in my church know this, but the word Christ literally means anointed one. I don't mean to be silly, but it wasn't his last name. Some people don't even understand, you know, what the word Christ means. It means anointed one. It means that God had been promising that he was coming. And so Simeon had been told that he would not see death before the Lord's Christ. And he came by the spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him. After the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms. I read this story multiple times, and I think it's the first time it ever stuck out to me. Simeon grabbed a hold of baby Jesus. He, he grabbed a hold of him, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles. You know, there, I, I could preach a message just off of that right there. A light to lighten the Gentiles. What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Well, listen to me. Gentiles were all of those nations that were not Israel. Israel because of the exodus. Israel because of the sacrifices. Israel because of the yearly reminders. Knew that there was a God who had a plan. Who promised to send the Christ. But all of those other Gentile nations. Listen, at the time of the Apostle Paul. There were places that churches were established. Places like Ephesus. Places like Corinth. <laughs> places like Greece. What we know today as Rome, Italy. You know, they were worshiping false gods over there. You know that? Like in Ephesus, they worshiped some goddess named Diana. They, they were in darkness. They were basically demons that they were worshiping. That might offend some to say that other religion. No, it's you're either worshiping Jesus or you're worshiping demons. Wow. Amen. That's just the truth. Amen. Do you think that the people liked it in Ephesus whenever the Apostle Paul showed up and began to tell them that they were worshiping false gods? No, they didn't like it. They wanted to stone him. But there's either right or there's wrong. It's either the truth or it's not. Right. And, and, and listen, he said this. He said, you have come to bring light to enlighten the Gentiles. When you don't have light, you don't know where to go. The whole Gentile nations were in the midst of darkness, but praise God, he had a plan. And even through Old Testament Israel, he promised to give Jesus. And then through Jesus, the apostle Paul, who was a, re a religious zealot of the Jews, got saved, hallelujah, and filled with the Holy Ghost and was so on fire for God, he, nothing could stop him. He, tra he traveled in boat, he traveled on foot, and he had to tell everyone everywhere that he went the good news about Jesus Christ. And the Gentiles, this prophecy came true is the point that I'm trying to make. This prophecy came true. Listen to me, you can't get, you can't get excited enough about God's plan. And not only that, but Lydia, the first European, we're on Lydia Street, the first European convert, Lydia, listen, she got saved on European soil. Western civilization received the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the Apostle Paul. The pilgrims showed up on this land right here. And they planted, at least according to the rotunda in Washington, they planted a cross in the soil, in the sand, and they said, this nation's going to be for Jesus. <laughs> and what I'm trying to say is that had it not been for the gospel, the Gentiles wouldn't have light. They'd still be in darkness. People like you and me, we wouldn't know who to worship. We wouldn't be able to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. God's plan works. Amen. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through your own soul also. Simeon told Mary, a sword is going to pierce your soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You know, we don't need to take too much like and feel like Mary's some co-redemptress. That's not what's being said here. Basically, what he's telling her is you're going to experience pain related to the birth of this boy. And the reason that you're going to experience pain of what's happening to him is it's going to bring revelation about the hearts of many because of it. 
See, whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is spoken and preached, you're, you're faced with an opportunity. You're faced with an opportunity to either reject that gospel or to accept it and allow your heart to become a manger for the birth of Jesus to take place on the inside of you. And when you allow the birth of Jesus to take place on the inside of you, guess what happens? Your heart, your own very heart, listen to me, it, whether you be an unbeliever today or a Christian today, when you submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ, your own heart is revealed unto you. Because when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And He begins to reveal unto you. Through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in unison, the heart of man is revealed unto Him. Nothing else can do that. The psychiatrist can't do that. Sodium pentothal can't even do that like Jesus can do it. Whenever the Holy Spirit is given liberty to work in the hearts of men. Amen. He says, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many. Yea, a sword will pierce through, and the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And then, that was Simeon, there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a hundred, she and had lived with a hundred seven years, with a husband, I'm sorry, with a husband seven years from her virginity. So basically, she was married for seven years. <coughs> And then she was a widow for about 84, which departed not from the temple. So after her husband died, she just lived at the temple of the Lord. And, uh, but she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. I, you know, there's just so much going on here. I know I kind of interrupted the story, but there's a lot of things that are going on in here. I mean, Jesus is born. The angels are singing. The shepherds get a revelation. You know, they bring him to the temple. Simeon shows up. He gives a prophecy. Then this old lady, Anna, shows up. Everybody's being led by the Holy Ghost to move towards this situation. Amen. Amen. That's taking place. And the story of Jesus really does seem to be a little incomplete if we don't at least talk quickly about the wise men, right? I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to real quickly <laughs> just say the wise men followed that star all the way from the east. And we don't know with certainty how they knew it was his star. I've talked about this before in the church. But I have to believe that it was a mixture of the same thing that moved upon all of these people that we just heard about in the previous story. A mixture of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that moved upon them to move towards this birth. Amen. Now, I can't prove this. But if you can come up with a better reasoning other than this, then you let me know. Okay. I mentioned before that in the ancient Old Testament, approximately 1450, 1500 B.C., in the book of Numbers, there was a prophecy that came forth, even really from a false prophet named Balaam. He was sent by a king to curse the children of Israel. But what he came up with was that he could only speak what God told him to speak. And what God told him to speak was, and when he got a revelation, he said, my, I'm in a trance, but my eyes are open. And what I see is that there's going to be a star that rises out of Jacob. There's going to be a star that rises out of Jacob and a scepter. It's not here yet, but it's coming and a scepter will be in his hand. <coughs> then uh, about in, in 740 B.C., Isaiah. So we're talking about close to 700 years later. Isaiah would prophesy that a ruler over the world would be born out of Israel. So we have a 1500 B.C. prophecy that's recorded by in the book of the Jews that says that Jacob, a star is going to rise out of Jacob, right? Which is, you all know who Jacob is, right? Okay, we've got to back up a little bit. I mean, it's okay, we're going to take our time. Some people, we've got some guests today. That's why, they, they, whenever y'all get aggravated with me on Wednesday nights and Sundays, y'all like, oh, the preacher keeps repeating the same thing. That's because you need to know the Bible. And I can't make you read the Bible on your own, so I'm just going to keep on repeating the same thing. Listen. God had a plan and there was no nation called Israel and he called a man named Abraham and he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And he gave him a son named Isaac and Isaac had two sons and one of his sons name was Jacob and out of Jacob came the 12 tribes. The prophecy said that there's going to be a star that rises out of Jacob, meaning it's going to come from Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. 
And so 1,500, a star is going to rise. 700, Isaiah says, a ruler will be born. And then Daniel in 600 B.C. I'm trying to tell you that I can't prove it from the scripture, but there's no better way to figure out how these wise men knew that this star had anything to do with a king. I'm here to tell you how they knew. Daniel in 600 B.C. was deported from Jerusalem to Babylon where because of his obedience, God raised him up and put him over all the wise men and all the astrologers in the area of Babylon and then later also in Persia, which is the east where these wise men came from. Now, listen to me. If you're going to think for one second that Daniel did not go around talking about the scriptures that he knew and had learned as a young boy when he was the one who God saved out of the mouth out of the mouth of the lions, when he was the one that refused to eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine, when he was the one that refused to bow down or not to bow down and to kneel and to pray at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. to his God and his God alone. No, Daniel was a man of God. And in spite of all of that, God still raised him up because God had a work for Daniel to do. And it's just my belief in my heart that Daniel told these wise men, there's a star. <clears throat> There's a star that's going to rise in the sky one day. You want to look at the stars, Mr. Astrologer? Well, you need to look on the horizon because there's coming a day when there's a star that's going to rise up and it's the star of Jacob. And there's going to be a scepter in his hand because it's the star of a king. That's what those wise men said they were coming looking for. We're looking for a star for the king, the king of the Jews, because his star is in the sky and we have seen it. And there it is, 600 years later, at the birth of Jesus, these wise men from the east come seeking for a star and looking for a king. It's amazing how God proclaims and preserves his word. He uses men as mouthpieces. He uses men as writing instruments to document and to preach his word. He will accomplish his word. He looks over his word. Amen. I need you to know that even Caesar. Caesar didn't even know. Even He even uses the ignorant to accomplish his work. Uh -huh. Caesar didn't even know that he had a part in fulfilling prophecy. In the year Caesar causes a taxation to take place, everyone has to go back to their hometown. David, up in Nazareth, near the Sea of Galilee, has to travel some 60-so miles all the way down to Bethlehem, where the lineage of his family was from, the city of David, because Joseph and Mary both come from descendants of David. They had to travel down. Caesar didn't know that he was fulfilling prophecy. God orchestrates the, 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 the movements of mankind. God orchestrates the history of mankind. God is in control. Amen. Not man. God is sovereign. Man can try to fix things all he wants to, but God is maneuvering and accomplishing his plan. God looks for people who will be willing to allow their lives to be governed by his word. And even then through them, he accomplishes his will and he will protect his plan in his word. I just had this one scripture I wanted to put up real quick. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 12. I, 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 as, as I started looking at this, I was just thinking of the fact that all the prophecies that were fulfilled through this one birth is just amazing. But I wanted you to see that sometimes whenever you look at the earth and you look at the world and you see the way things are going, we have a tendency to get shaken a little bit. We start to wonder... Is God really in control? But this scripture here was to the words of Jeremiah. Now in this first chapter, God, let me just give you a little context. God had called Jeremiah to be a prophet. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I already called you to be a prophet. And then he said this, I will put a word in your mouth, Jeremiah. And when I put a word in your mouth and I tell you to speak it, don't look at the people's faces. Because they're going to make some crazy looking faces at you when I tell you to speak forth my word. Don't you be confounded or confused by their faces because I'm going to take care of it all. And then he says this. He says, of the priests that were in, uh, in the land of Benjamin. No, it's, I'm sorry. It's Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11, starting in verse 11. It says, uh, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? This is after he's told him, I've called you to be a prophet. I'm going to put the word in your mouth. And then he's asking him, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see the rod of an almond tree. Oh, okay. 
What does that have to do with anything? Well, Jeremiah knew what it meant. You and I might not know what it means. But see, they called the almond tree the awake tree. And the reason that they called it that was because it was the first tree to blossom in the season. So it was an awakened tree. It was always, it was always awake. So when they saw, and that's what the Lord let Jeremiah see. And then look at this in the next verse. Then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. That word hasten, that usually means to do something hurriedly. But in this word here, it literally means a watchman that never sleeps. The almond tree is the awake tree because it's the first that blossoms. The hasten is the watchman that never sleeps. And he says, I will hasten my word. I'm the watchman that never sleeps. And I will make sure that my word will accomplish what it is that I set it out to accomplish. And if I say that I'm going to bring a son into the world, if I say I'm going to bring a ruler into the world, if I say there's going to be a star that's going to come out of Jacob and a king's going to be born, I guarantee guarantee you that is going to happen. Amen. How the word of Jesus' birth affected these characters that we read about. The first ones that I thought about were the angels. The angels praised and proclaimed the word of God. Look at Job chapter 38 verses 6 through 7 real quick. I thought this was amazing because in Job 38 what the context is right here is, is that the Lord Job, you know, Job went through a lot. He went through a whole lot more than any of us have ever been through. I mean, we've been, you know, a lot of us have been through some things, but we ain't been through what Job's been through, right? And Job was feeling down, and it's normal. Human emotion, we can get down, right? But finally, the Lord said, you know what, Job, why don't you just stand up? Stand up and gird your loins, and I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to give me some answers. Because you seem to seem like you got some answers. And one of the things he started asking, were you there when I created this world? Job. And that's what he's talking about in Job 38, verses 6 through 7. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, if you've studied with us, then, we, then you've learned that a cornerstone is connected to the foundation of a building. Nowadays, we pour a slab. Back then, they laid a cornerstone. It was the first piece that they would build a foundation upon which they built something. God's asking Job, were you there when I laid the cornerstone of this building that we call this earth that you live upon? No, you weren't. But what I will tell you is this, is that the stars, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God. That's another way of saying all the angels of God shouted glory when I laid the cornerstone. This morning I was reading that. I was like, Lord, you are so good. The Lord started preaching to me in my heart because Jesus was the cornerstone. You hear what right. I'm trying to say? Whenever God laid the four, first cornerstone, of the original creation, the angels of God sang hallelujah. And when he brought the cornerstone of the new creation upon the earth, the firstborn of God, to allow a new creation to take place in the hearts of men, the angels sang and gave glory to God. On this night that the Lord was born, the angels sang, they proclaimed, and they preached the gospel hallelujah of Jesus Christ. The angels Proclaimed the shepherds preached. The text said that they, with haste, hurriedly, they said, Let us go to Bethlehem, and they found Jesus. And then it says they went around telling everybody the news. You remember that? When we read it, they went around telling everybody the news. Simeon. Simeon saw God's salvation. He picked God's salvation up and he held it in his arms, is what the Bible says. You ever just want to hold on to Jesus? Amen. That might sound weird to you if you never held on to Jesus, but it won't sound real weird whenever you go through something and you don't have nothing else to hold on to and everything else that you try to hold on to keeps slipping through your hands like, like fine sand and it's not working and you get desperate and you get hungry and in your brokenness you hold on to Jesus and he's like the anchor that holds beyond the veil Hallelujah. in the midst of the storm. He never lets go. Amen. He never loses us. We need to learn how to hold real tight to Jesus. He saw God's salvation, he held on to it, and he proclaimed salvation for the entirety of the world. He will bring, he is the light that will bring light to the Gentiles. Yes, amen. Anna thanked God and she preached Jesus throughout Jerusalem. That's what she said. I like that. I read that this morning again to it and it hit me. She said, you know what it said? She went to all those that were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. <laughs> Y'all can remember times. Joy, this might be for you because I know you kind of like me. <laughs> I can remember so many times that I tried to witness to people that really weren't looking for redemption. 
Don't misunderstand me. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. But sometimes you can see the twinkling in their eyes. Anna was smart. She's like, I only got a few years left. I got to make sure that I make this work. Who's looking for redemption in Jerusalem? Because I got a story to tell you. Amen. The birth of the Savior is here. Will you hear the good news about Jesus? Anna spoke and preached about redemption through Jerusalem. The wise men in that story, I mean, I didn't really tell you that part, but when they finally got there and they found Jesus, what did they do? The Bible says they fell down and they worshipped him. The wise men worshipped him. Mary, what did she do? She pondered. She heard everything that them shepherds said, and it says she pondered in her heart. Herod, we didn't really talk about him. What did he do? He plotted. See, Mary pondered, but Herod plotted on how he was going to kill this whole situation. Yes, when the news of Jesus is spread and he is allowed to be born into the heart of men, it has an effect on people's lives one way or the other. It's either going to cause their hearts to become hard and bitter and turn against it, or it's going to soften their hearts and it's going to make them hungry. You know, the word ponder means to have a meeting or a discussion with oneself. You know, and whenever you've heard something or you've gotten the news and you roll it over in your own mind and you contemplate it and you, and you think about it. I had a good little talk the other night with Matt Darden. Y'all remember whenever Matt came and preached at the church for me when I had gone uh, away for uh, one night. And, um, you know, Matt was telling me that he, in his message when he was preaching, that one of his, well, his his uh, sister's boyfriend had come. And he said, I've been telling this dude about the gospel. He said, I don't know if he's the one. I hope he, I hope he receives Jesus. I know that. And he said, I've been telling him about the gospel. I've been telling him about the gospel. And he said, that night he had a dream. He had a dream and he was in a courtroom. And essentially the dream was, was that the enemy was trying to call him guilty because Matt had been talking about justification. That, that God in heaven can declare you innocent of all charges based on the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is that that young man was pondering the gospel in his heart. He was having a discussion within himself so much so that he went to bed and he had a dream and the enemy was trying to call him guilty. But the good news is, is that if you have received Jesus Christ, amen, you're no longer guilty because amen. of the blood of Jesus. Amen. I thought about Herod, you know, plotting. And I thought about him trying to kill all those babies, Satan using him to try to kill all those babies, but to, to try to destroy God's word and God's plan. But God said, like a sleepless watchman, like an almond tree that blossoms first in the season, I will guard over my word and I will make sure that it accomplishes what it was intended to do. But when I thought about <laughs> that happening, it made me think about abortion. And how Satan wants to destroy life and prevent souls from really ever hearing this story about this baby born in a manger. I just was curious, so I started to kind of Google notable people who were nearly aborted. You'd be interested to hear this list of people. Steve Jobs was almost aborted. The guy for Apple Computer was almost aborted. That, this does not by any means say that I'm endorsing any of these people's lifestyles, by the way. <laughs> I'm just telling you who almost was aborted. Cher was almost aborted. Jack Nicholson was almost aborted. Justin Bieber was almost aborted. One interesting note on Justin Bieber, he said, this is what Justin Bieber said, a fetus is a person, it's a life. Now, don't leave here thinking that Justin Bieber saved just because he said that, because he got a big old Illuminati tattoo on the inside of his forearm. But what I'm saying is, is that I thought that was interesting. Justin Bieber is over here pro-life. Yeah, because his mom almost killed him. <laughs> but the one that really stuck out to me was Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow was almost aborted. Now, the story behind that is a little bit different. This is the story behind that. His parents were missionaries in the Philippines. His parents were missionaries in the Philippines, and she didn't know she was pregnant. She contracted dysentery, and she became deathly ill. She was in so much pain that they just given her huge amounts of uh, pain medications and anti-infectives. And it wasn't until later that they realized that she was actually pregnant. Once they realized she was pregnant, based upon all of the medications that they had been given her, they had a very poor prognosis, right? They said, this is not good. We wish you would have known. But now, because of this, you're going to just go ahead and you're going to need to abort the baby because it's not going to be a good thing. Then to add, make matters worse, her placenta started to detach because she wasn't going to listen to them at first. 
But then all of a sudden her placenta started to detach and she started to lose blood. And it was really getting bad. <clears throat> and they kept telling her that she needed to abort the baby, but she refused to listen to what they said again and again. They explained to her as though she were an ignorant child that the baby would be malnourished and be permanently damaged if he even survived. My mom gave me Tim Tebow's book and I read it. And in one of the quotes this, in his book, Through My Eyes, Tebow wrote this. The doctor told my mom that she needed to abort the clump of cells that was in her body and that those cells were no different than a tumor in her belly. They wanted to take me out and throw me away. Wow. Wow. I know that people have differing opinions about Tim Tebow, whether or not he was ever really an NFL quarterback. Uh, but I do know this. I can tell you he was a winner. He's a fighter. And he's told a whole lot of people about Jesus. Amen. Amen. And while he was on his way to winning the Heisman Trophy as the quarterback at the University of Florida, he would write scriptures on the black tape up under his eyes. I don't know if y'all remember that or not. But he would put those scriptures and he changed the scripture up every week. And while he did that, it was proven that that was the scripture. Whichever one he had under his eye was the most Googled and searched after scripture in the whole nation for that week. Listen to me. Until the college people started complaining about it, then he gets to the NFL and they don't want him kneeling anymore because he knew that he had a purpose in his life and Jesus had been born in his heart and he wanted to let people know about the good news of the Savior. To think that they said that he was going to be malnourished. I mean, this is this guy was an animal, right? <laughs> People were researching to see what Tim was saying, and what he was saying was the same thing that the angels said. It was the same things the shepherds said. It was the same thing Simeon said. It was the same thing that Anna said. He was saying the same thing that Herod tried to kill. He was saying the only thing that brings life on this earth, good tidings and peace to all men, for unto you in the city of David is born a Savior. Amen. His name is Jesus. Amen. Last week, we focused on Joseph in relation to his response to the news about Jesus. This week, two things stuck out about Mary in my mind. Number one, point number one, she submitted to God's will for her life. Luke chapter one, verse 38. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. How can this be? She said, I've never been with a man. Whenever the Lord revealed it to her through the words of the angel, she said, your word, let that be my will. Your will, let that be my will. Even though it didn't make sense to the logical mind, she had to make a choice on whether she was going to submit to the word and the will of God. You know, I know that there's times in our own life that we wish that God would send an angel. Man, you ever thought about that before? Boy, I've been seeking the Lord about this, and I really wish God would send me an angel to make it clear. Amen. But I will tell you this. God does desire to make it clear to us, and the way he wants to communicate to us is through his word. He's given us his word. The problem that we have many times is that we don't really know his word. Now, I'm just being honest with you, and I can think that I can say that because I know that for Several years as a Christian. I'm not trying to speak to everybody. I don't know how much you study your Bible. I'm just telling you from my own personal experience. I was a Christian for 12 years. I tried to go to Sunday school. I even tried to read my Bible. But I really did not understand it many times in its right context. And so I didn't really understand the Word of God. God's people have had a problem since the beginning in the garden when Satan approached Eve and twisted the Scriptures through the time frames of, of, of Jesus' ministry or the Old Testament prophets twisting the scriptures. During the time frame of Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees had added 600. I can't develop this thought, but you got to trust me on this. 600 of their own laws that were not in the word of God, they had added it to the law and expected the people to keep it. None of that was it. still today. Preachers. Take what they learned from their daddy preacher, from his daddy preacher. Not really necessarily their daddies. I'm just saying the fathers. They're learning empty traditions from their fathers. The ones that taught them. This preacher teaches this one. That one teaches that one. That one teaches that one. And they never really all go on to the text. Well, I'm not saying that they never go to the text. But they're already going to the text with the mindset that they've already been infiltrated with. That this is what it says. Instead of letting the scripture speak to them. So that they can speak forth the truth of God's word. One thing. I will tell you, I'm far from a perfect man. I'm far from a perfect preacher. But one thing that I can tell you that the Lord told me was this. You keep your, this is how God talks to me. He may not talk to you this way. 
You keep your grubby little fingers out of my word. You find out what my word says and you let my word preach. Amen. Right. And if you let my word preach, then me and you can be okay. And you'll be doing what it was that I asked you to do, which was to let my word preach. Speak it to my people. They might not always like the way you say it. They might not always like the way I said it. But if you will speak my word to my people, at least they can hear my word and they can make a choice whether or not they will listen and obey. Amen. 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 While it may be a little different today, it's not completely different. Like we said, these preachers have done these things. But fortunately for Mary, that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the problem for Mary. She knew God's word because God sent an angel to tell her. Amen. I need you as a vessel. Will you submit? That was the next question. Will you submit? Two obstacles in the life of the believer. His word. Do we know it? Number two, his will versus our will. Will we submit? God's word works. I said it. I can't tell you how many times I preached it. The problem isn't God's word. The problem isn't God's plan. If there's a problem, the problem is with Matt. The problem is with Matt's submission. The problem is with Matt's surrender. God's word works. Amen. The question is, will we believe it? Will we surrender to it? That was number one. She surrendered, submitted to God's will for her life. Number two, she pondered in her heart. Luke chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. Whenever the shepherds were talking, he says, And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Everywhere the shepherds proclaimed the news, the people wondered. They wondered, which means they were amazed. She pondered to have a meeting with oneself. In other words, she sat there and thought about all this that was going on. Robert sent me a video. I don't know if y'all saw it about those construction workers singing Mary, Did You Know? They, I heard it was on Facebook. And, you know, I just was thinking about the words in that song. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? You know, and all of these things that Jesus did. And she's pondering. I mean, she's getting a revelation of some of the things that God is already fulfilling, but she doesn't understand it all. She pondered. She's thinking on it. But can I tell you that we don't always get, we don't get all the revelation at once. As a matter of fact, God's revelation to us is always progressive. God's will for our life is always progressive. We don't know it all at one time. Amen. Even though Simeon had told her soul, told her that her soul would be pierced with a sword, if at that moment she would have been brought fast forwarded and seen him hanging on the cross while she was in the manger with him wrapped in the swaddling cloth, what would have happened to her heart? She would have been broken. She couldn't have handled that. Yeah. You can't handle it either. Because see, I'm trying to make it personal for you today. That God has a plan for your life. First off, we need to know His Word, but we also need to understand that we need to that there's a time frame. She was pondering, but she didn't know the whole thing. She understood some things, but she didn't know it all. But when I think about all of the scriptures that were fulfilled here, and I know that she didn't know all of this, but Hebrews 2:14 says that he, you don't have to turn to each one of them, but because we're just going to try to move through fast. But Hebrews 2:14 says that because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he became the same. The scripture told us that he was going to be a man. Genesis 3:15, way back in the Old Testament, way back right after the fall, God told the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head. The seed of the woman is going to crush your head. We were told that he would be born of a woman. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, we were told he would, be, he would come from Abraham. Numbers 24, 17, we already spoke about that. He would come from Jacob because a star would rise out of Jacob. Genesis 49, 10, he would be a king from the tribe of Judah. 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1 through 17, he would come from David. David came from Judah. The Messiah would come from David. Isaiah 7, 14, he would be born of a virgin. Micah 5, 2, he would be born in Bethlehem. Isn't it amazing that the wise men came through town and said that they were seeking the king and Herod asked all the scribes, the teachers of the law, where is he going to be born immediately? Bethlehem. Micah said he'd be born in Bethlehem, but none of them followed the wise men to try to find the king that they said had been born. 
I guess my point, though, is that Mary thought deeply about her life and God's will and everything that was going on around her. But I can assure you that she didn't know all this was being fulfilled through her willingness to submit to God's right. own word. She, there's no way she knew all that all at that same time. At the same time, I'm not trying to make more of a man than what he is, but I can assure you Tim Tebow's mama didn't know that he was going to win a Heisman Trophy and tell millions of people about Jesus while he was doing it. And also, but I will tell you this, she did know, some, she knew God's word, thou shalt not kill. Amen. And she knew that God had a will for her life. I can assure you that you or I will ponder many things about God's will for our lives, but I can also assure you that we won't know it all at once. He will reveal his will to us one step at a time. But the first step started when Jesus was birthed in your heart. That's the meaning of Christmas to me. I'm getting near the end. Y'all hang with me. That's the meaning of Christmas to me. I'm not trying to be a Grinch. My, my family calls me Grinch. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why. Because one day I kept all, and all anybody ever wanted to ask me was, you ready for Christmas? You ready for Christmas? And their meaning was, did you get all your shopping done? And one day I told this dude, I said, you know what, man? I don't mean to be rude. But if, 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 if you're asking me if I'm ready for all this commercialization junk, dude, I'm done. I'm done with this. Amen. And I told somebody that yesterday. Santa Claus done stole the show, man. Santa Claus done stole the show. And where's the glory for Jesus? Amen. It, for me, amen. You don't even have to clap. I know it's true. Christmas to me isn't Santa Claus. It isn't opening up presents. It isn't lights. It isn't trees. Christmas to me is remembering the birth of the king, the savior of the world, and the fact that God gave the greatest gift of all, his only begotten son, and that Jesus gave me a precious gift, his righteousness. When the exchange took place, he took my guilt on him at the cross, and he gave me his righteousness, Romans 5, 17, as a gift, the gift Amen. of righteousness. Amen. 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 I meant to put in here that Christmas also isn't the saints beating on the Falcons today, although I will enjoy it quite thoroughly. But that's not Christmas. Christmas is Jesus. Amen. I'm going to close with a quick story. There was a preacher named Jess Moody, and he tells a story that one night he was teaching a Bible study. And in that Bible study audience was a woman named Rose Kennedy. Now, I can tell you that the Kennedy family were staunch Catholics, and I don't think that... Rose ever grew up necessarily to be a great disciple of the Lord, but I can't say that. But this is the story that she was in that Bible study. And that night he challenged his hearers to make their hearts ready to meet the Lord because life is short for all of us. And no one knows what the future may hold. Rose Kennedy got up after he had said that. And she walked up to him privately. Now, this was the mother of John F. Kennedy. She walked up to him privately and she said, Preacher, I just wanted you to know that what you were talking about tonight, she said, I did that. She said, I did that before. As a young bride, she said, I was caught up and enamored by money and power and all of the things that were connected to it. She said, and then my husband and I had a daughter. She was so beautiful. But before you know it, it became obvious something was wrong. And the doctors told us that she was born with a severe form of mental retardation and that she was going to have to be institutionalized. And the devastation that started off eventually turned to enormous anger towards God. How could you have done this to us? She asked the Lord. The anger became a kind of corrosive bitterness that drained every bit of joy from her life. One night, she and her husband were getting ready. They were about to go to, an attend, uh, to attend a social gathering, and they were getting all primped up. And they decided at the last minute not to go when she realized that her anger had consumed her. She said, if one person, one more person asks me how my daughter's doing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off. I don't even want to go to the social gathering. And in the midst of all of that, their maid, who had been working there, came up to her and said, Mrs. Kennedy, I've been watching you for the last few weeks, and I've seen how angry you are. If you don't do something, it's going to ruin you. I think you should pray this prayer. And this is the prayer that the maid of Rose Kennedy told her to pray when she saw her with all of her anger. Oh, Lord, make my heart a manger where the Christ can be born. She fired the maid on the spot. <laughs> but when she laid down in the bed that night to sleep, those words rolled over and over and over in her mind. She tossed and turned, probably on her high-dollar cotton sheets. She couldn't sleep. 
And finally, she submitted and prayed, Oh Lord, make my heart a manger where the Christ child can be born. And you know, what was interesting is this, like I said it earlier, she, I know she was a Catholic. I don't know how much she grew in the Lord, but I can tell you something had to happen to that woman that night. Because the first thing she did was she hired that maid back. <laughs> she said, please come back to work. Come back to work for us. And that maid worked there for the next 20 years until she died. The point that I guess I'm trying to make is this, is that what did Mary, Tim, Tebow's mom and the maid all have in common? They heard the word of God. They knew the will of God and they obeyed.